Thank you for joining me here at this online training for your thinking about mental health, choice, and addiction all wrong. And it's not just choice, it's actually biology as well that most people fail to understand. So anyone that is coming to this training probably has this question of why do some people get addicted? Why do some people have mental health issues? And especially in the US, we have this very simplistic notion of it's either your biology, which means it's often genetics is what people are referring to, or it's a choice. And the reality is that both of these perspectives are wrong. They're just a small part of an overall, much more complicated model. And this isn't just your average person. These are therapists, these are clinicians, these are legislators, these are people setting policy. There is just a very strong lack of understanding in our country about what drives addiction and how those different factors interplay with each other. So the biggest problem that we're going to look at here is moving from a linear model where we have biology and genetics on one side and then choice and free will on the other and assuming that there's just some gray area in the middle. That's not accurate. It's a much more complex, much more nonlinear system of influences. And we'll also go through why those single issues or those single factors are not actually that relevant. Uh, we're also going to dive a lot into unconscious elements of the brain and learning and how that combines with these other factors to end up with someone struggling with addiction or mental health issues. So I'm Nick Jaworski. I am the CEO of Circle Social Inc. And that's relevant to this discussion here because what my company does is we work with addiction treatment providers and behavioral health clinics across the US. We work with small little local providers all the way up to the large national providers that are working across the country doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue. We have a consulting wing and then we have a marketing wing of the business. And what we do is we go into all of these providers and we observe their clinical programs, we interview their patients, we look at their data, we interview their clinicians, we interview alumni, then we go through their systems, their processes, their finances, their marketing departments, their call and admissions departments, anything and everything to do with the business to make sure that they're connecting with patients in the right way so that they can be successful. We do this with nonprofits, we do this with for-profits, so at this point, we have uh, over a billion dollars worth of operating data for addiction treatment behavioral health providers. And then we have over $100 million of marketing data, which is more on the consumer end. So what are people looking for and what is important to them when they're searching for addiction treatment or behavioral health? So that data is really important. But then we also do a qualitative analysis, like I said, when we go in and we actually look at what's happening in the programs, we're observing the clinical groups, we're talking to these patients, we're talking to the therapists, the clinicians, and what we see is just this large lack of understanding uh, of what the causal factors are for addiction and behavioral health. And this is really important because if we don't really understand the uh, influencing factors, then we are not going to be able to effectively address it. So that's one important thing to understand about where I'm coming from um, and kind of the data that we're bringing to this training. Uh, another piece that is useful to understand is I spent about a decade abroad. So I lived all over the world, uh, largely in Turkey, Vietnam, China, and then obviously in the US. And when I was in those countries, I learned to speak the languages. It's just a hobby of mine. I get very deep into the cultures and different cultures approach things very, very differently. And so that allows you to have an outside perspective. And you'll see that sometimes as we go through this, when we're connecting the elements in a systems approach, rather than just a simple binary dualistic biology choice or something in the middle. Um, that cross-cultural understanding is also gonna be really, really important because mental health manifests differently in different cultures. And that's something a lot of people don't realize, obviously because they haven't spent extensive time in other cultures or been interested in mental health or addiction issues at that time as well. Um, so those pieces are important to kind of understand where we're coming from. Data is really important. It's a big piece of what we're gonna get into. And then also obviously I personally went through addiction when I was younger. Uh, so 18, 19, 20, you know, so God, I'm 38 now, so about 20 years ago uh, when I was in early college, I used to drink a lot and I got into trouble, got some DUIs, uh, ended up as part of the court system and was diagnosed as a result of that as an alcoholic at that age. And so I remember sitting there, I'm talking with my counselor and she says, well, Nick, you're an alcoholic. I said, well, how do you know? 
right? Because what I'm doing right now is the same thing that most people around me are doing, right? You go to college, you go to frat parties, you go to other parties, people are engaging in very high risk behaviors, lots of alcohol, sometimes drugs. Um, so for me, I didn't see anything that different. She says, well, you're here. And so that's part of the problem. Well, I said, you know, lots of people could be here. They just haven't gotten caught. Well, she says, well, maybe they have a problem too, right? But the other thing is that you're not accepting this. You're clearly in denial, which is a sign of your disease of alcoholism. And I, I, said, I said, wait a minute, you know, I'm a pretty logical person. I said, so if I was to agree with you that I'm an alcoholic, I would be an alcoholic, correct? And she says, yes. And I said, but if I disagree with you, then that means I'm in denial, which is proof that I'm an alcoholic. So either way, I'm an alcoholic. This just doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Uh, and she's like, well, then, you know, this is just part of your disease, right? You're here and this is clearly evidence that you're struggling with alcoholism. So I had this early journey um, where I got into the addiction treatment system, obviously from the inside and, and started to see some of these just really weird perspectives in terms of approaching things. And the treatment program that I went to was really bad. It was just poorly set up. Um, there were large gaps between the way that people approach addiction and mental health and life issues, which is something that we're going to address in this training um, quite thoroughly. You know, giving an example, we had a woman that was in a domestic violence situation. And she was told when she started talking about this situation in the um, addiction treatment groups that the therapist would stop her and say, well, that's not something we talk about here. That's something for your therapist or that's something for your social worker. Here we're talking about your addiction. And even back then, that didn't make any sense to me. Obviously, her addiction was stemming in part from this bad home life that she had and all the challenges surrounding that. But for the addiction counselor, there was a complete disconnect. And we've seen that in the field. Uh, recently, the field has shifted to be more around what's called dual diagnosis or co-occurring disorders. But still this assumption as if there's two separate things happening, which really isn't the case. And again, we're gonna talk a lot about that. So just to kind of review, uh, lots of experience, both kind of personally and then from a professional end, working with a lot of addiction treatment providers, big and small across the country. Uh, international kind of multicultural approach and then the data piece which is really really important so people often use data poorly or they don't understand the data that they're using so what we're going to look at is how to approach the data in the right way and also what's surprising in the behavioral health and the addiction treatment space is that a lot of people don't even know the data they don't know the research and that's unfortunate so we're going to dig a lot into that research and dispel a lot of the myths to help us understand what these causal factors are for addiction and mental health. So here's an example of a data point. 75% of those addicted to heroin started on prescription opioids. So what's the story that they're trying to tell here? The story they're trying to tell is that prescription opioids lead to addictive use and lead to heroin, right? But that's incorrect, that's not right. So the real statistic is 3.6%. So less than 4% of people who abuse a prescription pill or a prescription opioid ever end up even trying heroin, much less becoming addicted to it. So this is a very, very small number of people that start with prescription opioids and then transgress or move on into heavier use and heroin use. And this is completely common sense, right? So what percentage of divers started off on the swim team or start off as swimmers. Most of them, right? Probably 80, 90% of divers started off on the swim team before they started diving. This is how human culture works. You get introduced to something and a small number of people get deeper and deeper into it. I'm from Wisconsin. We have the Green Bay Packers. If you are any modicum of a football fan at all, you will know who the Packers are and the Cheeseheads, and you will see Packers fans go into the stadium in the middle of winter just in body paint and underwear, right? Freezing cold outside, and they're out there screaming, cheering on the fans um, in, in little to nothing. What percentage of those people started off watching the Packers on TV? probably 100%, right? No one just jumps into going extremely nuts and taking all their clothes off and going up in body paint and then going to a Packers game, right? There's a very small percentage of people and a very small percentage of fans that do that. 
So drug use is the same. Um, this whole kind of concept of gateway drugs has always been a conversation in the U.S., and it's largely inaccurate. Uh, I'd say it's almost completely inaccurate. You know, even if you look at something like marijuana, it's under 6% of users ever go on to use anything else. So yes, the vast majority of people that use other drugs started with marijuana, but that does not mean that marijuana led to that use. And this is a huge misconception within the U.S. that we'll dig into as part of this kind of overview, uh, is the fact that drugs somehow drive addiction. Drugs are a very, very minor factor in addictive use. Um, most people that use drugs do not end up addicted. So we're going to do a quick pop quiz to see if you have any background on addiction, especially um, and we'll get into the mental health issues kind of throughout this. I just like to focus on the addiction piece because we do a lot of this and it stands out for people. It's a bit easier for them to understand, um, but we'll loop this into the mental health perspective as we go throughout the training. What percent of people become addicted to prescription opioids? So I want you to think about that for a second. Okay, so you have that number in your head. A lot of people usually will guess 80%, 90%. I, I talk to a lot of people in the street that are very fearful, right? They went to their dentist or they went to the doctor and they were prescribed an opioid and they're like, oh my God, you know, I, I don't want to become addicted to this. I am, you know, I don't want to use it. I want something else. And we see a lot of research these days looking for non-opioid based painkillers or pain relievers. Well, the reality is that 2% or less of people who are prescribed a prescription for opioids for pain ever become addicted. And if they use a prescription opioid for three months or more, then that number will go up to 8%. So I'm gonna throw a lot of data and a lot of stats at you guys and a lot of people are gonna challenge these and they're not gonna believe them. And they're gonna think that this data is wrong. So all of the sources are on the last slide of this presentation. So if you just wanna to skip to the end to look at sources and get the links and go review the research yourself, you're welcome to. Um, sometimes I'll have it on the page, but you're always gonna be able to find the source. So this particular one actually comes from the National Institute for Drug Abuse and Nora Volkoff herself, uh, who is one of the most well-known researchers on addiction in the US right now. Um, so she has made very clear that, you know, only about 8% of people that have used for three months or more end up becoming addicted. The vast majority of people do not become addicted. Uh, this is just kind of one of the myths that's been perpetuated out there is this idea that somehow the, the pills driving addiction and if you take an opioid, you're, you're going to go down this path that leads to heroin and homelessness and all this kind of stuff. Um, it, it's not correct, it's not accurate, uh, it's not even close, right? So really important to kind of understand that. Here's another one. Are people more likely to recover more quickly on their own without professional help from cocaine or marijuana? Let you think about it for a second. So obviously most people will say cocaine's a harder drug, but the reality is people tend to recover on their own without professional help within four years of getting into addictive use of cocaine. Um, so it becomes a problem in their life. Marijuana is about six. So again, this comes back to common sense, right? Why would someone stop doing cocaine? There are a lot of negative consequences to that. Um, it's very expensive, right? Marijuana is very cheap comparatively. Um, you have to have access, it's harder to find. You're also gonna have a lot of negative life repercussions. If you get caught with cocaine, you're much more likely to suffer a very high jail sentence. Um, there's gonna be social stigma around it. People are gonna be more fearful of cocaine use, including your family, uh, than they would marijuana use. So there's all these pressures to get off of cocaine, which leads people to get off of cocaine quicker. And this will come up again as we kind of discuss these issues, but there are these external forces that are having an impact on people um, that are, are not just in these simple choice biology dichotomies. There's so much more going on. What two drugs do people tend to use the longest in an addictive manner? This is an easy one. I bet you all know this. So if you guessed alcohol and nicotine, you would be right. Uh, the average length, I'm trying to remember, I think it's 15 to 20 years for nicotine and alcohol use. It's very long. Again, this kind of goes back to the same issue with the cocaine though. Alcohol and nicotine are very easy to access. There's much less social stigma around it. It's not illegal, so you don't have legal repercussions for the most part with these. 
Um, like I said, it's accessible because it's cheap, it's everywhere. So this is the one that people tend to use in an addictive manner or a problematic manner the longest uh, before they seek help. What percentage of people with a substance use disorder need professional help to recover? So a lot of people think that everyone that has a substance use disorder needs professional help to recover. Uh, again, they'll often think that it's some kind of permanent biological disease that they can't change, uh, which we'll get into as not being um, wholly accurate. So the reality is only 20%. So of everyone that is diagnosed or diagnosable with a substance use disorder, including alcoholism, uh, sometimes people separate those two, 80% will walk away on their own. Uh, very common sense here, again, why? Why do people walk away on their own? Most of the time, as we'll see very shortly in the data, it's careers, it's family, it's wanting to move on with their life and do things that are different. All of these reasons are why people will leave addictive use and not need professional help. We tend to look at the people that need professional help as a typical example of people struggling with addiction, but they're actually the minority. There are definitely people that really need support to do it and can't do it on their own, but this is no different than any other area of life. If I want to become a professional gymnast, for example, I'm going to get a coach, right? I can't do that on my own. If I need help with math, I am going to get a tutor, right? Most people don't need tutors. Most people are able to do fine and well enough in math without support, but some people need that extra support and addiction and mental health issues are exactly the same. Um, sometimes people need a coach or they need a professional to help them through when they can't do it with their own, um, their own support networks and their own internal resources. What percent of addiction is accounted for by genetics? So some of you might be familiar with studies by George Kube and others, or even Nora Volkow uh, quotes a lot of these. Uh, a lot of people will say 50%. And that is wrong. So it's less than 9% is a genetic factor for addiction. Um, not for mental health. Mental health is different based on the different disorders or illnesses that people are struggling with. Um, but for addiction, in specifically, it's genetics. I would also make a point here, though I don't have the data to support it, that most of the mental health statistics you see out there are also probably high or wrong. Um, you'll often hear that 25% of the U.S., or at least 25% of U.S. women are struggling with a mental health issue of some sort, uh, which kind of points to the fact that maybe it's more normal than anything. If you have a quarter of the population, a uh, quarter of the population that's doing anything or behaving in a certain way would be a pretty large percentage for most other aspects that we look at. So people will challenge this a lot. They'll say, well, I've seen uh, studies, you know, that say it's, it's 50%. Well, they're based off of twin studies is really where it's come from. And those twin studies were not done well. There's a lot of problems with twin studies that we're going to get into. So that less than 9% is um, information that's put out there by the National Center for um, Biotechnology Information. They do a lot of research on addiction and mental health. And also by uh, John Kelly, he's, a Har he's over at Harvard. Uh, he studies addiction there for the Recovery Research Institute um, and does addiction studies for the university. So that's where that number is coming from and we'll talk through why that's important. What percentage of addiction or what percentage have addiction rates in the US grown since the start of the opioid crisis in the US? So the opioid crisis really started kicking up in the 90s um, and we've just seen overdoses skyrocket since then. So large, large increase of overdoses and we'll look at that data in a second. So what percentage have addiction rates gone up? The answer is they haven't. It's a trick question, they've dropped. So actually less people percentage-wise are struggling with addiction than in the past. So this is really confusing to people. How in the world can we be having more overdoses but less addiction? Well, that's because they're not connected. We don't have people dying because more people are getting addicted. We have people dying because more people are using opioids. And opioids, when you mix them, especially with alcohol or benzos, you're very, very likely to overdose and die. Um, there's also some cultural and some economic factors that we're gonna get into that have also increased the death rates, which is good point, important to understand. Uh, but you know, even when you look at things like heroin, like it's really, really hard, if not almost impossible, to overdose on pure heroin. 
Uh, it just really doesn't happen. Now, if you mix it, then there's a very high potential to overdose. And that's been the big change. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago when we had people that were, let's say you caught your kids smoking pot or, or maybe you caught them, you know, with cocaine or something like that. You, you're going to be upset. You're going to be maybe nervous about it, but you're not so worried that they're going to die. Nowadays, there's a very real chance that there's going to be overdoses. Uh, and then when we get into the more heavier synthetics, like the car fentanyls and the fentanyls, these you can overdose on uh, individually, and that's also driving up the overdose deaths in the country. So let's start with the genetics piece, because that's the thing that people don't understand the most. Um, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time on walking through genetics and how they affect addiction, mental health, and just behavior in general, whether it's positive or negative. So the most important thing to understand is that DNA is not destiny. So this is a P, right? And this is about what most people in the US uh, have a background in as far as genetics go. You know, it's about eighth grade biology class, right? You had Mendel's peas and he could make the peas longer or different colors based on these, um, you know, the alleles of dominant and the recessive traits that you found. What people don't know or realize is that Mendel was not able to replicate these experiments with almost anything else. So having a dominant and recessive gene that it's a single trait or what we call a SNP, it's called a single nucleotide polymorphism that creates a trait through that dominant kind of gene transference. That doesn't happen almost anywhere. So most any, any kind of traits, whether it's physical or has an effect on behaviors is going to be polygenic which means that there are many, many genes involved um, in the passing of that trait. And then a lot of people have heard of epigenetics as well. Um, epigenetics is more complicated, but it's, it just means that the environment has an effect on gene expression, which is pretty obvious, right? Like we know that if you have or engage in certain activities or surround yourself with certain people, that that's going to have an effect on your behaviors and the way that you develop. And we're getting some very specific examples of that. But where people get confused is they think that genetics are somehow deterministic, and they're not at all uh, when it comes to behavior. Let's think of an example. So let's say someone in my family has a BRCA gene. If you are a woman, you probably know what this is. It means that you have a over 80% chance of developing breast cancer if you have this gene. So that's a high probability, right? But if you have that gene, will you get breast cancer? Well, we don't know, right? An 80% chance does not mean that you get breast cancer. So even when you look at things like addiction or mental health, to say that you have a 9% chance, even if you said that you had a 50% chance, that doesn't mean that you're going to get addicted. It's not an on or off matter. And also what's really important is you still have the ability to change through your environment or through choices that you're able to make that will change the probability ratios. So for example, as a man, uh, if I want to reduce my chance of getting prostate cancer, I just need to eat more broccoli. And I think it's a, I think it's 11% reduction in the potential of getting prostate cancer. If you exercise, your chances of getting cancer go down. If you eat right, your chances of getting cancer go down. So you can change the probabilities that are influencing any particular outcome um, by making certain choices. And so obviously behavior is no different. Let's take the BRCA gene, for example. I mean, in an extreme case, you, you can have a mastectomy and you can reduce your chance of getting breast cancer down to zero, right? So something that people will come to me with sometimes, and even professionals in the field will say, well, okay, but if you don't have the gene, then you can't get addicted. So you know, luckily for me, I don't have these addictive genes. And let's say that they understand that there's not just one because um, there aren't there's no single gene that's going to impact addiction or a mental health issue. Um, anything's going to be polygenic and everything's going to be a wide range of influences that are impacting it. So you go and let's say let's take lung cancer, for example. Right. So if you have a predisposition genetically to get lung cancer, will you get lung cancer? Well, again, we don't know, right? Well, what if you smoke a cigarette? If you smoke a cigarette, are you suddenly gonna get lung cancer just because you had a predisposition to it? No, that's not how genes work, right? It's not like you just get exposed to something and then suddenly you get that cancer. 
Now, people that have a predisposition towards lung cancer, if we take people that have been smoking for 10 years and take the people with the predisposition and the ones without, the ones with the predisposition are gonna have a higher percentage of that group that is going to get lung cancer, but not everybody, right? Only about 15% of smokers overall get lung cancer. The vast majority don't, um, though they'll often die from other health you know, complications. But that's the point is your genetics don't drive and make it automatic or predetermined that something's going to happen. Addiction is no different. You can't just be exposed to alcohol or a drug and then suddenly be addicted to something. Like it has to happen through habituation, um, through unconscious learning processes, through repetition and reinforcement in the environment, um, socially, culturally, all these pieces are gonna come together and drive addiction. And so you need to be thinking about mental health and mental behaviors the same way that you understand genetics related to cancer. It doesn't mean you're going to get it. Higher percentages are simply probabilities. And that's what we're dealing with everything here. So again, you know, this idea that bio biology and choice are somehow these two lines, that's not accurate. You have genetics, it's an influence, right? We saw that there's a 9% influence. Um, then we see social and cultural conditions then we see economic conditions, then we see internal life histories, then we see internal behaviors, skill, skill sets, especially related to coping. All of these things come together and they don't work in a linear fashion, right? It's not like you can just say, okay, well, this drives addiction because these two factors came together. Now, if I've got a negative social environment, very stressful, if I've got poor coping skills, if I've got a genetic predisposition, and my family also uses a lot, what's the likelihood that I'm going to become addicted? It's pretty high, but is it predetermined even with all these factors and all these negative pressures pushing towards addiction? No, I can still not end up addicted. At the same time, even if we fall into addiction, we can conquer that addiction, right? So this is very controversial, but it's the same thing as cancer. You can get over cancer. We like to say that cancer goes into remission, though we don't say the flu goes into remission, even though we get it again and again and again, right? Um, so it's just kind of semantics, the way that people talk about it or prefer to talk about it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's understanding that these pieces are, are not deterministic. Another example I like to give often is um, we do a lot of marketing. We have a lot of data. And if you go into the grocery store and you put the candy in the front where everyone can see it, people won't buy much more of it. Uh, let's say that you put the candy in areas where there's a lot of traffic so everyone sees it. Again, people won't buy much more of it, but if you put it at the checkout lane, then you have a 10 to a 30% higher chance of people buying that candy because it's at the checkout lane. So they saw it in the other places, it didn't work. So there's a couple factors going in there. There's decision fatigue, you're in front of it, um, it's cheap, it's easy to buy right at the last second, you know, that kind of thing. But no one would ever say that the candy being placed in the checkout lane is making you buy the candy. Another example from marketing is people that go to a restaurant on a rainy day are 30% more likely to leave a negative review for the restaurant. Is the rain making people leave a negative review? No, it just makes it more likely. So these are all probabilistic factors that go into people's behaviors, but people's behaviors are not determined by anything, whether it's a rainy day or their genes, right? There are always abilities to influence all of these. And that's not even getting into process addictions, right? When people are struggling with gambling or sex or social media, you know, if you listen to Gabor Mate, he, he does a lot of addiction studies. He was literally addicted to buying classical music CDs. And some people will laugh at that, but it was very serious. Like he was a surgeon and he literally left someone on the surgery table in the middle of a surgery to go buy a classical music CD. Like that's how intense his addiction was. You know, so it, it's very silly to say that an addiction is somehow triggered by someone's use of a substance um, because addiction is really a life issue. It has a lot to do with the feelings that people are getting and the experiences that they want to have. They're, they're looking for a feeling a lot of the time and that's not related to a substance. You can get that feeling. As I always say, take someone's cocaine away, they're gonna use alcohol. Take away their alcohol, they'll go to gambling or social media or shopping right? Like they're trying to get that feeling. They're trying to fix it or they're trying to find it. You know, there's lots of things going on there, um, but it's not the substance that's driving the use. So I hope that's starting to become clear. 
This is just an example I also want to give related to genetics. So if you look at Dutch men um, from the Netherlands here, they're the ones in the orange. So from a genetic perspective, um, the Dutch have a lot higher potential to be tall compared to American men, for example. Um, so American men are genetically, their, their potential is, is supposed to be smaller on average. But what we see here is America or the US is this blue line. So we can see from 1825, there's a little dip here, but then, oh yeah, sorry. No, all the way down here is the Netherlands, right? So the orange is down here. So blue, 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 blue. Finally, 1950, 125 years later, the Dutch finally passed American men. Um, so even though they had this genetic potential to be taller, they weren't. Now there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the big ones is there was a famine in the country for a long time. Um, there was also poor nutrition in the country for a long time and low socioeconomic status. So they didn't have access to the same food resources as people in America did. You know, so sometimes I'll get people that will be like, well, maybe the genes changed over that time. Well, that's two, three generations, right? You, your, your potential for height doesn't radically change in two or three generations. It is the environmental impact that is changing the gene expression. And that's just really important to understand that gene expression changes. It can be on or off. It can be higher or lower based on environmental exposure. And the way that genes express, interact with each other is also incredibly complicated. And again, there's no linear relationship here. Um, so just kind of pushing this fact home that DNA is not destiny. DNA is always malleable based on social, uh, internal, psychological, cultural factors. All these things go into what's actually going to be expressed from a genetic perspective. And even once that's expressed, we can still work to change it. You can get your mastectomy, you can exercise more, you can eat better, you can stop smoking. Um, there's all these things that you can do to change any genetic predispositions that you did have or any you know, diseases we could say that you're coming down with. Um, these things are, are multitudinal factors, right? So here's a quote that I hear all the time. Um, I, want, I, I want to be a drug addict when I grow up. People will say this just to kind of give the perspective that nobody wants to be a drug addict when they grow up. Nobody says that. So clearly it's not a choice is the story that's being given here. Um, but also nobody ever says that I want to get fired from my job again and again. Nobody says I want to get into bad relationships. Nobody says I want to be bad at math. Nobody says I want to be bad at sports, right? There are tons of things that people don't want to be bad at. You know, they don't want to get overweight. They don't want to be out of shape. Yet, how many of you here have struggled to diet or have struggled to exercise? There are tons and tons of things in our lives that we say we don't want, right? But we maybe don't put forth the necessary effort or there are lots of other factors coming into play that make it so that we keep following into these same patterns and we don't exercise, we don't diet, we get into another bad relationship, you know, whatever the case may be. So this idea that just because you don't want to be something doesn't eliminates the choice element of it is inaccurate, right? Um, so again, the genetics less than 9% is accounted for by genetics. We're gonna get into the twin studies uh, shortly here. And just kind of walk through that. Any effect on behavior is polygenic and genes can't determine behaviors. So we're gonna talk through that more uh, later on in this kind of overview. Um, but that's really, really important to understand is so any effect on behavior is polygenic and there is no direct impact on a particular behavior. Your genes can't make a behavior per se. Um, they're only probabilities. They can influence things. So often the analogy I'll give is that genes are a whisper in the ear. They have an influence, but it's not a very loud one. Um, and often you can do many, many things to lessen the impact of the genetic probabilities that you're born with. Gene expression changes based on environment. We just went through a number of examples of those, uh, the Dutch men with height being one of them. Um, and height's fairly simple, right? It, it's a physical characteristic. Uh, it has limited numbers of factors coming into play. It's much less complicated than behavior, right? Which is incredibly complicated. Um, dealing with the brain, which is one of the most complicated organs in your body. So important thing I have to understand all those pieces. Now culture matters a lot when we start talking about addiction. And this is something again to just drive home. So eugenetics is not defining what happens. 
So an example here, so Native Americans uh, in the US, their rates of alcoholism are at 14.9%. Uh, and that's across most Native American communities. I and mean, obviously there's a lot of different Native American communities and they're not all the same, but this is pretty prevalent. So one of the things you'll hear in genetics research is that here is an example of genetics driving behavior because uh, Native Americans have a genetic condition where they have an enzyme that doesn't process alcohol as well as let's say um, standard Americans or people from European descent, etc. cetera. Um, and so for that reason, when they drink, they get drunk much faster, right? You'll often see like a red flush, um, very easy to get drunk. And so the thinking goes, well, that's why they have such a, so much higher rate of alcoholism because the general populace in the US is only 8.1%. So Native Americans have almost twice the rate of alcoholism in their communities uh, among that population than the general population in the US does. Now, so here's the piece to help drive this home. Asian Americans also have that same genetic difference where they have an enzyme that does not process alcohol well. So Native Americans and um, Asian Americans or, or Asians in general have that same issue. Uh, Asian Americans have a 4.6% rate of alcoholism in the US. So they're half of the general populace, right? And they're almost four times less than your Native Americans, even though they have the same exact genetic predisposition. Um, this is really important to understand. So what's the, what's the driving factors here? Well, obviously it's culture, right? So unfortunately, you know, Native Americans have suffered a lot in America. Um, their languages have been lost, their histories have been destroyed, they've been relegated to small reservations, there's not a lot of social mobility. Um, all these things come into factor and come into play that drive up rates of alcoholism. And this is just again common sense, right? Who's more likely to struggle with alcoholism? Someone who just lost their father or someone who has both parents still living? Um, someone that came back from war and saw a lot of death and a lot of violence, or someone that you know just works at the local grocery store and never had to go away to war. Very clearly, these environmental impacts are going to influence our psychology. Uh, that's just common sense, right? But for some reason, we lose this common sense perspective when we start thinking about genetics, and it's kind of a curious um, part of, of American culture and the way that we approach this. But Kind of going back here, so Asian Americans, much less lower percentage, and culturally, there's just not a level of drinking in the culture, right? Um, if you look at Japan, there was actually a short period where Japanese businessmen started drinking more, um, but for the most part, Asians in general drink less. I always like to give the example of when I was in China at this wedding, these uh, high school age Chinese um, went up to a table with a bunch of beers on them, and they looked at each other, and I'm watching them, right? And then they looked at the beer, and then they went up and they smelled the beer and then they giggled and they, they ran away, right? And, and that was the end of it for them. Whereas if that had happened in America and those were American teenagers, I can guarantee you they would have stolen a couple beers and, and probably went off and drank them, right? Culturally, very, very different. Um, you'll see the same things with rates of, um, for example, we'll, we'll get into Israel in a second, or Italians. Italians drink regularly, often from a young age, wine with dinner. So alcohol is a normal part of the culture, whereas Americans tend to have a culture of access and they drink a lot more. So your rates of alcoholism in Italy are much, much lower than general rates of alcoholism within uh, America. Uh, another example, when I was in Turkey, you know, I had a couple students, I, I was teaching at the time, and, uh, and adult students, and the adult students were like, well, let's, you know, teacher, let, let's go out and let, let's get kind of crazy. I'm like, sure, sounds fun. Uh, we go to a gas station uh, and we get six beers for seven of us. And they're like, oh man, this is gonna be so fun, you know? And so obviously I'm coming from America, as I mentioned before, I drank a lot when I was in college. And uh, for us, that would be a joke, right? You know, you go to a keg party and you have all this beer for you know a small number of people. And for them, just one beer each was enough to get crazy, right? So culturally, there are very strong drivers that come into play when we're looking at how people use or abuse a certain substance. Um, regardless of the fact that they might have a genetic predisposition that affects the way their body processes alcohol. So here's another example I like to use. This is a really easy one. I'll ask you this question. So here we've got alcohol use disorder, so AUD here. And we're looking at the FSU, which is the former Soviet Union. 
these are Jewish individuals coming from Russia or the former Soviet bloc. So who do you think is more likely to struggle with alcoholism? Jews coming from the former Soviet Union, coming from Russia, or Jews that grew up in Israel? I'm sure you guessed right. So people coming from the former Soviet Union have an 11.1% incidence of alcohol use disorder, where Jews growing up in Israel or not from um, the former Soviet bloc have a 6% use. Very clearly, culture is driving these double rates of alcoholism among Russian Jews because that's what the culture is, right? You drink a lot more in Soviet, so the former Soviet Union, now Russia, and other countries than you do in Israel. Um, and again, I mentioned, you know, Israelis in general and Jewish populations in general have a much lower incidence of alcoholism overall uh, versus the U.S. We saw that we had 8% in the U.S. Here it's saying it's 6%. Um, and I've seen lower rates for, for Jewish uh, Americans as well. Uh, Jewish Americans tend to be around 2 to 3%, so much, much smaller here. Income matters as well. You know, just kind of continuing to explore these social factors, these social influences on addiction and mental health issues. Um, people that are you know, low income are much more likely to suffer with addiction and mental health. Uh, the numbers is somewhere between two and five times. There's a lot of other factors that come into play, but they're at least twice as likely to suffer with addiction and mental health issues. And just going back to some of the examples we talked about, there's a lot of toxic stress when you're in poverty, right? You are worried about bills, you have pressures on family, there's a lot more drug use around you potentially. You know, so these things are gonna drive addiction and that's why you're gonna see two to five times higher rates of addiction and mental health issues uh, among people with a lower socioeconomic status. It's really important to understand. Now again, does that mean that it makes them addicted? No, there are just as many opportunities. It is a probabilistic factor. They're maybe more likely to suffer with addiction and mental health, but it does not predetermine or determine that they will struggle with those issues. A really good example is uh, Hispanic women, for example. So in the US, uh, Hispanics in general and Hispanic women tend to be of lower income than the general population. However, they have much better health outcomes and much better mental health outcomes and lower rates of addiction than even middle and upper class individuals a lot of the time. This is sometimes called or referred to as a Hispanic paradox, but it's not a paradox at all because it's not low income that's driving people into addiction and mental health issues. It's everything that comes with low income, right? The stress, the trauma growing up, um, the lack of access to resources, right? These are things that tend to drive it. Whereas in Hispanic communities, they're often very close knit. There's a lot of hope, there's a lot of purpose, there's a lot of meaning. Um, you know, even going back to our Asian American examples, you know, sometimes Asian Americans are referred to as a model minority, meaning that they've become very successful in the US, right? Uh, where if you take uh, Native Americans where there's a lack of social mobility, right? You see these differences in the social stressors that are coming into play. The access to resources, the ability to move up or find careers or integrate with family and community. You know, these things are very, very important as buffers to addiction and mental health issues. So genetics is just a small, small part of all of this. Um, another example I love to give, four out of five upper income individuals drink alcohol. So if you are fortunate enough to be in that income level, you know that if you go to a legislative event, if you go to a business meeting, if you go to any kind of social function, there's always alcohol there, always. But people don't drink and get drunk at these events, right? They go and they have a beer, they have a glass of wine or two, and that's it, and then it's over. But when you look at lower income populations, they drink much less, right? There might be more illicit drug use but there is much less alcohol um, when you're in a lower income level. However, they're much more likely to struggle with addiction. So even though they're much less, like, less likely to drink, they're much more likely to become an alcoholic if they do drink. Uh, so this very clearly goes against the whole kind of idea where genetics is somehow driving this. If genetics was driving it, well, we're not saying that poor people uh, are poor because of their genes, right? This is something we used to say in the US actually back when you had eugenics, right? That was actually something that happened and something that people said, uh, which we'll talk about in a second here. But we've come to believe that that's ridiculous. However, for some reason, it's still okay for us to say that you're an alcoholic because of your genes, even though we can't say you're poor because of your genes. 
Um, here we're seeing that if you are struggling, uh, if you uh, make $50,000 a year or less as a family, you're less likely to drink alcohol, but you're still more likely to become an alcoholic. Um, that doesn't make sense from a genetic perspective, right? If our genes were evenly distributed, then you would have much more upper income individuals uh, drinking. And again, this data is coming from the government. This is coming from SAMHSA. It's a Substance Abuse Mental Health Association. And they do their studies in such a way to eliminate some of the factors that people will often come up with. They'll say, oh, well, you know, if you're upper income, then you have more access to resources or you're more likely to hide it. You're more able to hide it, you know, these kind of things. Uh, they factor that out, right, in the statistical analysis. So they look to eliminate all of those factors as much as possible. And these numbers are very different, right? It's not like it's a two to five and three out of five. You got a one out of five and a four out of five. So vastly, vastly different numbers. Um, so it's just kind of a myth that you'll hear a lot in the addiction treatment space where people will say, well, anybody can become addicted. Well, sure, anybody could become president. Anybody could become an astronaut and go to the moon. That doesn't mean anything, right? We're talking about probabilities here. So middle class, upper class, are much less likely to struggle with addiction than someone coming from a lower income background in the US. The unemployed are twice as likely to struggle with addiction. This one comes up all the time and people will say, well, you know, uh, it's because that when you're addicted, then you lose your job and so then you're unemployed. That's not true. Uh, they've done studies on this, and again, the government has done these studies, and you'll see all the links at the end of the presentation, so you can go and read them yourself. Um, but unemployment precedes addiction. Oh. So unemployment precedes addiction. Uh, they've tracked this, and they found that people that become unemployed start to struggle with addiction, and then when they find a job, then that addiction tends to fall away. So it's not that the unemployment is driving the addiction. The unemployment actually creates a scenario where they're much more likely to struggle with it. And then when they get that job, they tend to walk away and leave it behind. So in the words of David, or Dr. David Musto, uh, he's a psychiatry and history of medicine professor at Yale. You know, in the inner city, the factors that counterbalance drug use, family, employment, status within the community often are not there. It is harder for people with nothing to say no to drugs, which is absolutely correct and total common sense, right? So it's not the genes that are making them poor or making them addicted, that it's silly, right? It's all these other factors that come into play. Um, and genes can be a factor, again, like I just don't wanna leave that there and, and make people think that we're saying that genes have no effect at all. They do, it's less than 10%. Um, and it's not deterministic. Okay, so here is government data, and this goes through 2014. So this is substance use disorder in the past year and when people split by ages. You have 12 or older, 12 to 17, 18, 25, 26 or older. After 2014, the government decided to start splitting out by particular drug use. So you'll have um, heroin use disorder, opioid use disorder, uh, cocaine use disorder, methamphetamine use disorder. Like they split it out by different drugs. And so you don't see the data together. Um, after that point, you kind of have to come up with it yourself a little bit. So it's just, this is why it's only going to 2014 at the moment. So you can see here that the 18 to 25 year old demographic uh, has the highest rate of substance use disorder. And that should surprise nobody, right? If you went to college, if you were in high school, you probably noticed a lot of drinking and drug use comparative to now, uh, most likely if you're older. And we see that very clearly in the data. Suddenly at 26 years old, we drop from a 22% here, we're at 20% rate of use to somewhere between five and 10. So you have 50% of people that were diagnosed with the disorder suddenly no longer have it. Uh, what's happening here, right? Very common sense, people get careers, they get jobs, they get families, they have different life goals, they're not in a party environment, you know, all these things that we've been talking about factor whether or not people are going to be addicted. And so you'll hear all the time that addiction is a chronic progressive disease um, that's not borne out in the data, right? If it was chronic and progressive in the sense that it kept getting worse and people got worse before they got better, we would see these rates climbing um, as they get older, right? Because more and more people would take uh, alcohol, for example, they would use it socially and then they'd become a heavy drinker and then they'd become an addicted drinker. And so people over time would just increase, increase. But we don't see that happening. What happens is they actually stop using. 
Here's another example of that chart. So we can see here, this is illicit drug use disorder. So not substance abuse overall, but just illicit drugs or illegal drugs. Um, the 18 to 25 year old demographic, 7% of them are struggling with an illicit drug use disorder. And then suddenly they turn 26 and it drops to 2%, right? So you have almost a 70% reduction in the number of people actually struggling with the disorder that are diagnosable according to the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistic Manual that people use to diagnose mental health and addiction disorders. Um, huge drop off just because people age out. Like we said, most people walk away from addiction on their own. It's very, very clear in the data. Um, no, it shouldn't be any surprises though. People constantly are surprised that they're like, well, it's supposed to be progressive. It's supposed to be chronic. It's not what the data shows. Um, there are people that do struggle with it for a long time, but that's not the majority. So trends in substance use, substance use disorder in the past year among adults aged 18 and older. So this is all substance use coming from 2002 to 2014. And then you can see here, alcohol or illicit drug use disorder is in here. Um, so if we take that red one, we can see that we started at 9.4% in 2002 and is now down to 8.4%. So we actually lost a, a full percentage of people um, struggling with addiction. So as I mentioned way back in the beginning when we did that quiz, there are actually less people struggling with addiction now uh, than there were in the past. And we'll actually see a chart in a second here where there's a, a much bigger drop. So if we look at, so that previous only went up to 2014, right? This one is also from SAMHSA, so from government data. It's the largest, some of the largest studies conducted in the country every year. Um, they went from 1%, well, so we'll skip them because that group doesn't change too much. So we can see here the 25 to 54 year old demographic, 4%, 5%, then it dropped to 3% in 2015, 3% in 2016. So again, we have the opioid crisis where um, addiction is or not addiction, but actually overdoses are skyrocketing, right? So a lot more people dying. But during that time, you know, opioid crisis started in the 90s. Continuously, uh, we've seen that addiction rates are dropping over those times. So people are not getting addicted more. Um, opioids are not are driving an addiction crisis. They're driving an overdose crisis. Uh, it, it's just sad, but it's really important to understand because people are misunderstanding. And so we've seen all these things come out um, talking about, for example, banning opioids. Um, doctors are scared to prescribe it. Dentists are scared to prescribe it. And that's too bad because it's not the drug that's driving the addictive use, right? Uh, we, we definitely should be careful with opioids because there's such a high potential for overdose um, when people are abusing it but at the end of the day that it's not the primary concern as we're seeing all these other factors, life history, trauma, um, culture, really come into play when we're looking at addictive use. So addiction rates are going down. Um, maybe that trend will continue. Uh, I hope it will continue, but the end of the day is that that's not the main factor. Um, the drugs aren't the problem in the addiction rates that we have in the US. Now here we see the opioid rates increasing, right, significantly. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, it's a bit speculative, right? We don't have 100% clear data, but if you want to think about who is the person that's most likely to die from a drug overdose. So this is researched, right? This is clear in the data. Um, the person that's most likely to die is a white male. Uh, they're usually over the age of 30, somewhere between 30 and 50, usually, if I remember. I don't remember the exact ages. Um, uned or uneducated or up to a high school education, but no more, often unemployed and isolated. So they don't have family, um, they're, they're single, uh, there's no one else around them. Those people are most likely to overdose. And so what's happening in those situations is it's really passive suicide, right? They, they don't wanna live anymore. And you'll see this oftentimes, you know, sometimes you'll get e, e, um, EMTs or firefighters, or even police officers that don't wanna carry Narcan because they'll say, well, you know, this person's just, I have Narcan them five times in two weeks. They're not doing that because they really want the drug. They're doing that because they don't wanna live anymore, right? And it's, it's a little bit easier than taking a gun to your head, unfortunately. Um, so that's part of what's driving the overdoses up. The other part is really fentanyl and carfentanil. So getting the really strong synthetics have also really significantly increased um, overdose rates. So what's important to see here is you've got overdose rates per 100,000 in the population by age. 
So if we go back and remember who is the most likely to have an illicit drug use disorder or a substance use disorder in general, it's that um, 15 to 25 age demographic, right? So they're twice as likely, sometimes three times as likely to be struggling with a, a substance use disorder than other age groups, but you'll see that they're one of the least likely to die. So even though these people are using the most, they're overdosing the least. And that goes back to what we're talking about here, where it's really all these life stressors that come together. Um, obviously, you know, kind of going back to our, our diving examples or people moving from prescription pills to heroin, even though it's a small percentage, the people that do continue to use get deeper and deeper into the subcultures. Um, an example I often like to give here is, for example, how often have you heard of someone like breaking into a store and stealing to get their alcohol fix or get their nicotine fix? Doesn't really happen, right? Nobody steals to do that, but you will see it happen with meth or cocaine or heroin. So why? Why if people are addicted to alcohol or addicted to nicotine that they don't um, you know, end up stealing to support those habits? It's, it's incredibly rare. I'm sure there's you know, anecdotal examples out there, but we don't see it. Right, it's not very common. Well, because you're crossing a line, right? So let's say that you're hanging out with a bunch of people that are doing heroin. That's already illegal. What's the likelihood that people that are doing heroin have done other illegal things? Pretty high, right? Um, you're crossing a line from being within the law to being outside the law. And the deeper you go in those subcultures, the more likely you are to be with people that are going to break the law or willing to break the law, right? Whereas when you're using alcohol and nicotine, that's still legal. And so you haven't crossed that line yet. So this is kind of one of the factors that's coming into play when we look at what's driving use, you know, culture and your social group and the people around you uh, are, are very, very strong influences. Again, if you've got one person and, and five of their friends are heroin users, um, and then you got another person and none of their friends are heroin users, who's more likely to use heroin? The person with all the friends are using heroin. Again, it doesn't guarantee it. It's totally possible that that person might not use heroin. I mean, we had a guy that I used to hang out with in high school where we'd all go to the parties and we'd drink and get drunk and whatnot. And he never did, right? Even though all of his friends did. Um, that was an exception though, right? You know, most people joined in in, in those participated in those behaviors because that's what their social network's doing. Um, so we're, we're seeing that here, we're seeing progression possibly to harder drug use, but we're also seeing here that the synthetics are really driving up use. And so this is much more likely to be more accidental overdoses. So there's a certain level of um, intentional overdose here, you know, where we kind of talked about that passive suicide approach as being one factor um, that's kind of contributing, but then the synthetics are, are really driving things up um, significantly after that time. So let's get into the twins and really kind of wrap up the genetic piece of this and understanding all these social cultural influences. And then we'll start getting into really brain, um, unconscious learning, and these other important factors in addiction and mental health issues. So here you have the genin, uh, quintuplets, quadruplets, quadruplets, I think it is. So four twins, right? Quadruplets, I think you say. Um, so this was a famous case actually where all of them had schizophrenia bipolar depression they had all these um, disorders that they were diagnosed with and so it kind of speaks to the blindness of the culture uh where all these psychiatrists and psychologists and other researchers went in and said oh my god look at this you know all four of them have schizophrenia or all four of them have bipolar disorder um clearly it's genetic well if you ever look at their family histories it, it was horrible uh, all four children were abused and raped from a very young age by their father. They were often isolated. Um, they were beat. Uh, lots of very negative things that happened to all of them. And so researchers come in with this kind of presupposition that somehow genetics are, are driving this behavior. Um, and then they completely ignore all the sociological factors. And we see that really consistently through decades of addiction treatment mental health research where people just completely ignore uh, that aspect of it. You know, they're often looking for a simple answer. They're often looking for this linear causality where it's like some simple genetic answer, even if it's a multitude of genes coming together. Um, somehow we can find this genetic answer that drives addiction. But going back to what we've been talking about this entire training, genes can never determine your behavior. They can only be an influence on it. Um, and there's lots of other influences that can counteract that or mitigate those effects. 
in different ways. And there are also choices you can make that allow you to mitigate it. So what happened with twin studies? Where did we go wrong? Why does George Kub and Nora Volka say we have a 50% chance of genetic um, transference being responsible for addiction when you know John Kelly over at Harvard is saying it's less than 10%? It's because of twin studies. So people were looking at twin studies. They looked at um, fraternal and identical twins and they said identical twins and let's take an adoption study and then let's say that this twin is raised in one home over here and this twin's raised in another home over here. And let's see how likely it is that they both end up addicted. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this. So twins aren't, even identical twins, aren't actually identical in their DNA. Um, it's possible and this has happened where one twin has autism and the other twin doesn't right their genes are different they're not exactly the same um, so basically when genes are being copied or when dna is being copied there's about a 30 percent difference in, in the copy pairs and obviously if you've ever been around twins or know them they look different right they don't look different at first but then as you get to know them you clearly find the small differences um, so there's genetic variation in physical traits, there's genetic variation in everything else as well. Um, so that's one reason why it's not a great idea to use a twin study as some kind of like um, the golden rule for references. Mitochondrial DNA, all right, the DNA within your mitochondria is also different in twins. Um, mutations, so obviously your DNA mutates, right, and mutations in the brain cells, about one in 10, for example, so lots of changes there. And then genetics are not consistent throughout one's lifespan. As we've been talking about, we have epigenetic changes, we have environmental influences that determine whether gene expresses or doesn't express. We have differences in the way that genes will interplay with each other. If one gene decides to express, that may completely change the equilibrium and the balances about other related genes and what effect that they're having on a person's um, expression overall. So really important to understand there. Uh, and then genetic similarities are abnormal anyway, right? So even though there are all these differences, identical twins are still much more alike than the vast majority of the population. So let's say that you had 400 different genes working together that somehow created a high probability of addiction, right? Even though, again, we'll talk about how that's not possible. Um, let's say that that was the case. Well, what's the likelihood that those 400 genes are gonna be working in the same way and have the same arrangement and the same interrelation with other genes in anyone else that's not an identical twin, like it's almost zero, right? The probability is so low. So one, they're not the same, and two, the similarities that they do have are really not transferable to the rest of the populace because there could be such a high level of similarity that it's statistically you know, impossible that that would ever happen in other individuals. Um, so for all these reasons, twin studies are not the golden standard. Um, they're actually a pretty poor standard when it comes to evaluating behaviors. And we've seen this with twin studies because if you look at them, they'll assign a genetic influence to everything from politics to people's view on slavery, right? Well, these things are culturally malleable over time. Um, political groups change over time. Political groups are different between countries. So it's pretty silly, uh, but we do see a lot of um, genetics kind of come up with, with really what I consider absurd ideas around how um, genetics influences behavior. Uh, we even had a private equity firm call us a couple weeks ago and you know they were looking for genetic biomarkers for opioid use disorder and you know it's very clear with them that you're barking up the wrong tree right genetics have a minor influence on overall opioid use disorder and so finding a genetic biomarker for a particular response might help a tiny little bit but it's not worth investing millions of dollars to figure this out because it's not really going to change what you can do for people um, Often when we speak to like medical professionals, uh, even legislators we work with, there's a very big under misunderstanding that again, that somehow the drug's driving the addiction or the genes are driving the addiction. So if we could just find that, then we could fix everything, which is just completely not true. Um, okay, so let's start moving into the brain. I hope that everyone's really understood now that genetics are just probabilities, they're not deterministic, and that a lot of other factors go into play and that any genes that do have an impact are um, minor in nature. So, you know, just like lung cancer, I can't automatically get lung cancer just because I have a predisposition for it. I still have to smoke for five or 10 years and all it means that I'm more likely to get lung cancer than someone else that doesn't have that predisposition. But again, only 15% of smokers get lung cancer, right? So that means that even of the 85% that had a predisposition, they're still not getting lung cancer. Addiction, mental health, same issues here. 
So getting to the brain, the other thing that we'll hear a lot is that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain, and this is why you have your depression or your anxiety or your addiction. So there has never ever been a theory um, proposed by anyone that, that, not I shouldn't say there hasn't been a theory, but there's never been a study that showed chemical imbalances leading to um, these kind of disorders or behaviors. You can't look in the brain and, and measure levels of certain neurochemicals and then determine if someone is anxious or overly clinically depressed or struggling with addiction. That doesn't happen ever. It's never happened. And so if you just do a quick Google search for, you know, chemical imbalances, depression, chemical imbalances, uh, anxiety, addiction, all you'll find is a bunch of uh, research articles debunking the myth. And they just talk about how it's never been true and that it's just this weird cultural myth, myth that's developed. And you'll, you'll hear it from professionals as well. And I think sometimes it's just an easy way maybe to explain things is that, well, you have this chemical imbalance that we're trying to adjust. Um, maybe it's a little bit simpler and people help them kind of get a grasp on things, even though it's not really accurate at all. So why is that the case? If neurochemical balances aren't actually what's affecting the brain, how is the brain working and how are people developing these behaviors? So what you have to understand, and this is critical, if you're gonna get anything out of this, I really want you to understand this piece. Neurobiology is built through neural networks and synapses, and these have to be built. And the only way that they can be built is through life experience. So you can't have a gene that creates a behavior because behavior is only developed through lived and learned experience. They're like roads. So imagine your brain and all your neural pathways and synapses that work together with them, like the roads in a city. And when you first start off, when you're a baby, for example, um, those roads are not very well developed. They're maybe rural roads and they're gravel or they're dirt. Uh, or maybe you get into city roads, but they're very small and they don't take you where you need to go very fast because you have to stop and start and you know, it's expensive to build these out. It takes a lot of time. But over time, you develop certain behaviors, certain beliefs, certain thought patterns, and these become uh, routes that you use on a very, very regular basis. These are your highways that you're trying to build out, right? So if I want to get from my house to work, which I go to every day, I prefer to build a highway to go there as fast as possible. Your brain does the same exact thing. The more you use something, the more you do it, the better road it will build, let's say. And then all these connections come into that road, right? So when you build a highway in a city, what happens? You get a lot of traffic, and a lot of main roads that kind of feed into it. You get on ramps, you get off ramps. So as your brain builds a highway, it becomes more interconnected because more of the roads then connect to the highway, which solidifies or crystallizes the behavior. It makes it stronger because which way do I want to go to work? Let's say I have all these old roads that we built, right? The country roads and some of the street roads with the stop and go lights all the time. What behavior would I prefer? Do I want to take the one that takes me 40 minutes to get to work or the one that takes me 15 minutes to get to work? I want to use the one that takes 15 minutes. And they've done a lot of research on this. And the, drain, the brain actually uses the most energy in your body out of any organ, uses about 25 or 20% 20 of your body's overall energy each day. So your brain is constantly trying to save energy. Uh, a lot of these brain processes that we'll talk about are built around energy conservation. How can I do this in a way that will require the least amount of effort? And so using that highway is one example of this. So let's say that we've got an addiction highway, right? And that's the pathway that we've developed over time. And again, none of these roads get built right away, right? It takes a long time. You will never ever meet someone that just went from drinking one beer to becoming addicted, right? You've never met someone that was completely fine one day and then the next day without any you know, crazy stress like a loss of a loved one or something, woke up clinically depressed the next morning. These things don't happen. They happen over long periods of time and through things like feedback loops and building roads and other things that we'll continue to talk about here. So I've got my addiction pathway, right? And I want to change that pathway. I need to build a new road. Is that easy? If I'm the city, can I build a new road just like that? No, I need a lot of time and I need a lot of money, right? 
And so let's say I want to build a road for sobriety. Well, that's going to be really, really difficult here, right? What you want to understand is physical health and mental health are very similar in the way that you develop and change them. I can't walk into a gym and just say, okay, I want to be fit and go to the gym tomorrow and then suddenly be fit. I can't go to the gym tomorrow and decide I want to lose 20 pounds. That's not how physical health works. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and you have to be consistent with it. Building a new neural pathway in your brain is exactly the same. You can't just say, oh, I want to build a new pathway. You can start, but then you have to be very, very consistent over time. Um, so, okay, we're building this new path towards sobriety here. Is the old road gone? No, the old highway is still there. And that's really important because this is where things like relapse come into play. So even if I'm building this road towards sobriety, it's really hard, it's really difficult, it's costing me a lot of money or energy um, in your brain's lingo, I can still see that old superhighway. And there's all these connections to it, right? Because I built all these roads that go to that old superhighway, whereas the new superhighway doesn't have a lot of connections to it yet. So it's hard for me to get there even if I want to take it. Now over time, the new superhighway I build will be more used and will be more kept up, right? The city is going to keep up the roads that people are using. And so your brain is going to do the same thing. And if you stop using an old highway, you might let it fall into disrepair, right? So some of the connections to it are going to disappear. People are going to build new roads that go around it. You know, all these things are going to kind of come into play. So it's possible that I'm going back to the old road. And if I do start to use that old road again, well, then the city's going to start to repair it, right? The city's going to be like, oh, people are using this road. We better keep it up. We better put some money into it. Better repair those on-ramps. Better repair those potholes. Your brain's going to do the same thing. If you start to use an old road, it will start to rebuild it, right? So that's one of your dangers. So your brain, what people misunderstand, or maybe they use the wrong terminology, is they'll talk about rewiring re your brain. You can't really rewire it. Uh, the old pathways are still there. And that's why we don't forget how to ride a bike, for example, right? You can not ride a bike for 20 years and then suddenly go and ride a bike and you'll still be able to do it. That pathway might be hard. And I've seen this actually with people where they hadn't ridden a bike for 20 years and they struggle with it a little bit, right? It does happen, but then they're able to do it pretty quickly. And so your brain's the same way when we're coming through behaviors, thought patterns, belief systems. Um, these are very, very embedded processes and they become unconscious. And that's really an important point that we're gonna cover in a bit here. So just looking again at how the brain works, it's all about feedback loops. So when something happens, let's say that you are, let's say that you, you don't get out of bed, you're a little bit sad, right? And you decide to get up late. And so you get up late and that causes you a bit of extra stress because then you were late to work as well and now your boss is mad at you. So your boss is mad at you, so now you feel even sadder than you did in the morning. And so the next morning, because you're more sad than you were yesterday, you used to sleep in again. And now you're even more late and you're even more stressed and your boss is even madder at you. And now you feel sadder, right? This is just a negative feedback loop that develops. So again, no one ever goes to bed one morning and then wakes up the next morning clinically depressed, right? They start off sad and they get sadder and then they get more depressed and more depressed until finally they can be diagnosed with clinical depression, for example. Anxiety, PTSD, all these things operate off of feedback loops. Now there are some episodes that are episodic, right? You know, so you could get into a car accident and that works with your brain in a specific way to traumatize it. Um, we're not gonna get into that. That's I think something I wanna dive into in another training. It's a little bit more complex to kind of walk people through, um, but the feedback loop is the most important process. So feedback loops can be positive or negative. Let's say that you're successful and you did, a, let's say you're a sales rep, right? You go out there and we see this all the time. I've run sales teams. They have a great day, they're very successful. So the next day they come back and they're more successful. And the next day they come back and they're more successful because they feel that success, they feel excited, they go out there, they work hard, you know, people they're talking to feel that excitement and that positivity and it just ends up being this positive feedback loop. And so our mental health is exactly the same. We have to work to build those new highways and that's gonna be that positive back and forth consistently to get that highway to be built. Now, the importance of initial conditions is super important here. So again, we don't really see this. It's this slow process, you know, but uh, initial conditions is, you know, if you talk to like general systems theory or chaos theory, right? They'll talk about a butterfly's wings in India or in the US can cause a hurricane or a typhoon in India, right? Because that wind builds and builds and builds and builds. 
just like our example where someone got out of bed late and that's all that happened because they felt a little bit sad ended up spiraling down into them getting sadder and sadder and getting out of bed later and later until they ended up getting fired from their job which then pushed them into clinical depression right this stuff happens all the time and so the importance of initial conditions is really really a big part of it, it seems small we don't notice it at first our brain starts building the pathway building the pathway building the thought behavior patterns and then suddenly it's a super highway and we're locked in and it's very very hard to break that loop and get out the more you build it the longer you build it <clears throat> the more arteries you have going to that super highway and the harder it is to change so i want to talk a little bit about um neurochemicals again here this is a Another piece that people really don't under, understand at all. So like when you're taking like an SSRI, for example, so if you take medication uh, for depression or anxiety, these medications will change your serotonin levels, your dopamine levels, but they do it in a very general soupy way. They're not specifically targeting anything. So they kind of go into your brain, this general soup. Um, and what's happening there is there is a neurochemical balance change, but there's no attendant change in your highway right? Your neural networks haven't changed. They haven't developed in a different direction. So I like this quote. Uh, it's just actually a new song. It has, came out not too long ago. I'm sick of being okay against my will. What the hell does that mean, right? How can you be okay against your will? So what they're talking about in this song is Oxycontin, actually. Um, and they're saying that, well, when I take it, I feel good, but I, I feel like I'm being good against my will. How, how can that happen? Well, we have a lot of different areas of our brain sending different signals that want different things, desire different things. So it's very, very normal that we have different parts of our brain kind of jostling back and forth, right? And then your prefrontal cortex or the executive areas of the brain take all of those messages and then kind of come up with a decision and an action uh, in some cases. And so that's where we feel like we're arguing with ourselves. So this is a really good example, though, of how a lot of these SSRIs and other um, mental health pills work, is they've gone and they've changed the neurochemical balance so that it's sending signals that you're happy or you feel good, right? But your brain's still following these pathways that's saying we don't feel good and we're supposed to be thinking a different way. And so it becomes this kind of clash. And so what's very useful with um, prescription pills and other medications is that they can become a springboard for you. So I can take this pill and suddenly I can feel well enough to get out of bed. And if I feel well enough to get out of bed, then maybe I can feel well enough to go and engage my family, my support network, a counselor, a therapist. And now I can start you know, wiring my brain so I can build out these new super highways or I can build out different highways so I can get out of the, the, my clinical depression or I can get out of my anxiety. Um, we see the same thing with addiction, right? We have MAT, it's medication assisted treatment. A lot of people will use Suboxone or Methadone. Um, it provides that kick where it gets rid of the craving so you can think again, right? Because if your brain's always in pain, if it's always thinking about what it needs or what it wants, um, or if you have a lot of pain, you can't really think about anything else, right? If you burn your hand on a stove, you're not gonna be able to do a math problem, right? All you're thinking about is the pain. Uh, and so people get in the same way when they get really heavily involved in addiction because there's so much pain going on in their lives and they've lost the ability to cope with it um, or they've lost the ability to deal with these struggles because they've been using the drugs as a way to do that, right? So you have to, understand that any kind of pill or prescription is just a springboard for you to actually begin or initiate the very hard, very difficult work of going to the gym, going to your brain gym and changing your neural pathways. And once you do that, then it's gonna work. We know we can go back to our diet example, right? If I take a diet pill, all it does is reduce my, my cravings or my appetite. But if I don't exercise, if I don't um, learn to diet and change my, my motivations and my behaviors, the second I stop taking that pill, I'm going to revert right back. So that I haven't built up any new super highways. I've built up no new neural networks. All I've done is, you know, kind of suppressed a chemical signal in the brain. And that's not enough. All of it works together to drive our emotions and our behaviors and our thoughts. And so we can't just deal with one piece of it. We have to deal with all of it. So important part of this is brain change does not equal brain damage or disease. This is something that's often really misunderstood. On the left here, this is an example of uh, some research that Nora Volker did in the National um, Institute for Drug Abuse. And they'll say, look, these brains are different, 
because one is heavily using cocaine and the other isn't. Well, that's really silly, right? If you look at the brains of people who speak Mandarin versus those who speak English, they have different brains. If you look at someone who has become very good at math, right? Their brain will look different than someone who has not spent hundreds of hours becoming good at math. If you look at chess players, right? Really good chess players, their brains are going to be different. Your, your brain changes, it's plastic, it's not permanent because it's built through life experience. And so you're always gonna see differences in the brains, but that doesn't mean that it's permanently broken or damaged. And this is something that I just really wanna get across to people. It's something that really bothered me, you know, when I first was told that I was an alcoholic is, the message was you're broken and you're permanently broken and you're damaged. And that's not true. You're not broken. You know, something might not be going the way you want it to be, but it's totally 100% fixable. Recovery is always possible. Even if you look at uh, mental health issues, you have whole communities online of people that struggle with schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, that completely walked away from it, right? Maybe they did it with the help of, um, you know, SSRIs or psychopharmaceuticals. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just had a support network. Maybe they did it on their own. You know, there's lots of different ways to find recovery, but permanent recovery is always possible. And it doesn't mean that there's not a chance per se to slip back, right? You have that old super highway that could be kind of brought back into use. But the reality is that you can just go on living your life without having to deal with that. You can just completely leave it behind. And then the longer you leave it behind, the easier and easier it gets. So unfortunately, what happens in the popular culture and even within the recovery space, this is a really famous nonprofit organization. They say the science is indisputable. Addiction is a chronic disease that changes the brain. Well, great. Yes, it did change the brain, but it doesn't mean you can't recover from it. it doesn't mean that you're permanently broken. Um, when we struggle with addiction issues or mental health issues, it makes us so much stronger because we learn from it, right? We learn from our failures. I look back at my own struggles with addiction and super grateful, right? I would never change anything because I went own a seven figure company that goes and helps other companies make hundreds of millions of dollars while at the same time helping people find the care that they need and helping people with mental health issues and helping people with addiction issues find quality care and quality treatment that ability to do that in my life and it helps so many people in such a positive way would have never happened had I not learned so much struggling with addiction had I not learned to overcome failures you know I had, you know like for example I lost my license right at that time I had DUIs current drive I lived in Wisconsin and it gets really cold in the winter, right? You get these deep snows, you know, they're knee high. And I had to bike. I had to bike because there's no public transportation anywhere in the U.S., right? So I'm biking around in these horrible winters and it just teaches you to, you know, kind of deal with adversity, right? There was so much I learned from those experiences that were so difficult. Um, you could have gone the other way. I could have had a negative feedback loop where I just kind of went into depression and greater addiction. Luckily, I didn't. Right, I worked hard at it. I had family that was supportive. I had friends that were supportive. I had a lot of positive things in my life that allowed me to have a positive feedback loop rather than a negative feedback loop. So I think a key message that I wanna get across here is you're not broken. There's always hope. Um, and there's always a possibility of change. Really, really important to understand. So something else I kind of want to approach with these biomedical models when people get obsessed with the genetics or what, you know, the mis- uh, misinterpretations or misunderstandings around um, neurochemicals is here's an example from another study it says we found that people who hold biogenetic explanations for mental disorders tend to blame affected persons less for their problems so that's what people want they want people to have less blame less shame less guilt um, there's a positive aspect there and I've talked to people that felt it you know they, they thought because okay well maybe this is a genetic issue for me so I don't have to be so concerned with it and that made them kind of get into a positive feedback loop where they're able to get out of it. But per, these same people perceive them as more dangerous and desire more distance from them. So this was actually a meta-analysis of 25 different studies um, on this topic. And so we combined them all together and they all said something very similar that unfortunately when you promote this idea, because it's not accurate, right? Again, your genes aren't driving your behaviors. Um, people are more likely to stigmatize. And so people are were trying to come from a good place. They wanna eliminate shame, blame, and guilt, but unfortunately they've actually created a situation where people are much more likely to stigmatize 
um, people because they think that they can't change. They think that they're permanently broken. And so I want to get this message across very clearly. One, for people that are struggling, you're not permanently broken. You can change. And then for people who aren't struggling, your loved one can change. The people around you can change. It's just part of the process. It's totally normal. It's what happens. You learn to become different. You learn to become better. Um, and you learn as a result of your failures. So these things can only help people. So that's important. And then this one as well. Uh, perspective test supported Marlitt's development model of relapse. So this was talking about um, alcoholism in particular. There are two factors that predict resumed drinking. Lack of coping skills, right? So no surprise there. And belief in the disease model of alcoholism. So I don't want to get into a debate of what a disease is or isn't, right? A flu is a disease just as well as cancer is a disease. So it's not really very worthwhile to, to talk about how long something has to be around for it to be a disease or whatever. But the misconception is that somehow uh, disease is genetically determined, right? And as we've talked about a million times, that's not correct. What happens within alcoholism or addiction or mental health issues is people believe that they're permanently broken. And so they have a fixed mindset. So you are probably familiar with Carol Dweck's research uh, around children and people who have a fixed mindset. And so if they believe that they're bad at something um, and that's part of who they are, they're unlikely to ever become better at it. But if they believe that they're good at something because of the effort that they put in, not because of some natural tendency, they become very good at it. So it's a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And so this applies just as much to addiction and mental health as it does to learning in school. If you have a fixed mindset and you believe you can't change, you won't change. If you have a growth mindset and you realize that all these things that we're talking about where change is possible, you can build new superhighways in the brain, you become better at things, you can leave previous behaviors behind, this will help you do just that. So here's a really good video that I love to show. It puts all of this together uh, in a very concrete example. So let's watch this video on learning to ride a bike. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Sandlin. First attempt riding the bicycle. Alright. So, the faster I go, the better. Alright, so that's the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> Keep your feet on. <laughs> Alright, let's get together. <laughs> 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 
play, you gotta start rolling, at least. <laughs> and go! Oh, oh, God! Alright, <laughs> back up. Okay, okay. Keep your feet on the pedal. Go. Ah. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm going to see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm going to try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards. It's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, it clicked, it clicked. hold it, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. You think I'm faking. You don't believe me. That's so Actually. weird. You're like, no, 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 no. You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah, I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. All right. So I absolutely love that video because it takes everything that we're talking about and just puts it into a really nice experiment. Uh, just have to have to love what that guy did there. Um, so what we see is we see the unconscious pathways in the brain. And what we need to understand is that unconscious learning creates these automated systems or these automated pathways, or these automated algorithms, you know, as he was saying. And that's what drives our behaviors. It drives our thought patterns. It drives our belief systems. Right most of what we learn is unconscious and it's learned through massive data sets and lots of experience so you can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book about bike riding 
you can't learn to ride a bike by sitting in a class and letting a teacher tell you about how to ride a bike, right? Now you can get a little bit of benefit from these things, but the only way to learn to ride a bike is to actually get on a bike and continue to do it. It's the same way if you are learning to swim, if you are learning to speak another language, or if you are trying to overcome addiction or mental health struggles. The only way to do these things is to by constantly practicing them so it becomes an automated unconscious process. That's the key to this entire thing. The super highways that your brain builds are often not conscious. They are part of an unconscious learning process. And so your consciousness can help push those in a certain direction um, or they can initiate a feedback loop and get things moving, but it's not going to um, actually create the, the behavior or the change automatically. Really, like he did here, I mean, try to change the way that you walk, right? You can do it for a second or two, but the second you leave your conscious um, mental focus off of it, you'll revert back to the way that you normally walk. And the only way you could permanently learn to walk differently is the same way that this guy did learning to ride a backwards bicycle is it took him eight months. Now, the only thing I wanna clarify here is he makes a mistake and he says that children can do it faster because their brains are more plastic. This isn't actually accurate. So the accurate piece is, as we mentioned before, when you build up a, a pathway, when you build up a road in your brain, the more you use it, the stronger it becomes, the more length you have to it, the more other roads you have going to it. And so it becomes very, very interlinked and it becomes integral to a certain thought pattern or behavior. So the longer you do it, the harder it is to change or get off of that highway. So for a child, who has only had three years of an ingrained pathway or a superhighway in their brain, it's much easier for them to change than for an adult. Uh, language is actually a great example of this. So I speak a couple languages. I speak Turkish, I speak Mandarin. I've learned a couple other ones that I've forgotten over time um, since I didn't spend a lot of time in those countries. But you know, I went to Italy this summer for a month uh, and you know, my Italian got you know, almost conversational you know, by the end of that month just because I spent a lot of time on it. But if you tried to ask me anything in Italian right now, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, so I, I still speak Turkish and Chinese quite a bit. So those have stayed my super highways. Those are still there. Anyway, to learn a language, uh, I used to actually teach languages. This was what I did way before I built the um, consulting and marketing company. I could teach adults to be conversational in about a three month window. Um, many adults can, if they are really focused on self study and then do a lot of practice, and remember it's all about practice. It's all about unconscious learning. Um, you have to be saying it, you have to be hearing it over and over until your brain clicks, just like you did with the bike. But they can learn most languages in about a year. Children take anywhere from six to 12 years to learn a language, depending on the language and, and their own backgrounds. Um, so children sometimes sound better because when they're under the age of 12, their palates don't harden and so they don't tend to get an accent. Um, and also they don't get these locked in brain patterns so that their grammar doesn't have the same level of mistakes sometimes but adults can actually learn languages much faster and to a higher degree of fluency than a child in a shorter amount of time. Um, and that's based on these unconscious learning processes and the pathways. So important for people to understand that. So unconscious learning. So start with the language stuff. Like I said, I taught languages for a long time. You got two sentences here in English. I'm sure everyone listening to this speaks English or otherwise you wouldn't have made it this far. One first sentence is he ate there. Second sentence is he's eaten there. So if you know anything about grammar, you know that ate and eaten are actually the same verb. And you are actually just modifying the verb based on the tense of the sentence. So I can say he eats there is my present tense. He ate there is my past simple tense. And he's eaten there is my present perfect tense. So none of you know that, right? But you speak English perfectly. You have no problems understanding these two differences. Now tell me, when would we use present perfect? And when would you use past simple? You have no idea. Yet you use this language and you use these grammar patterns that convey the meaning all the time without problem. You've never even thought about it. You have no idea what the rules are, but your mind has created unconscious rules. And so you know that we only use the past simple for completed events in the past. And we use the present perfect for a number of reasons. Um, but this one is because there is an uncompleted area of time. In this case, a person's life. His life started in the past and it's continued into the present and that's not closed. So we are gonna use a present perfect tense here. Another example, 
what's weird about this sentence. It's imperative he leave by 11 o'clock. So some of you might have realized that it sh you would think it would be leaves, right? He leaves. We have a third person singular here. So we should have an S, but we don't. Why not? Because this is a present subjunctive sentence. These are not complicated grammar issues, um, but no one understands them, right? Yet you use them constantly and you use them perfectly all the time. And if you ever learn a new language, if any of you have spoken a second language or learned one, you see the same thing. What happens is you're, you're speaking, you're practicing, you're practicing, it's really hard, it's really difficult. You can't even make out the words at first, much less be able to repeat things. And then suddenly one day it just clicks. Uh, Turkish was a real kind of um, eye-opener for me. So Turkish is very, very different from English. So Turkish is really weird uh, because you have all these different pieces of uh, the language that actually attach to the back of, of things. So I can have the aspect and the tense of a word kind of gets tacked onto the back of the initial verb. I can get uh, prepositions uh, or directions being attached to the back of nouns. I can get possessions attached to the back of nouns. So I get these really, really long words over time. But what's interesting is that the vowels change based on the beginning of the word. So I could have um, a vowel harmony that goes with A's or with E's or with I's or with O's. It's very, very different. Your brain can't just understand it consciously. It has to practice it. And for me, after I was speaking it for about six months, it just clicked. And then I never had to think about it again. Didn't matter if I had heard the word before or not, I could automatically put in the appropriate vowel patterns based on the initial vowel of the word and change it all throughout that string without even thinking about it. And that's just what your brain does. It's always learning and doing unconscious processes. This is what intuition is. Intuition is really just a bunch of unconscious data points that you've never consciously paid attention to, but they, your unconscious brain has been processing those, processing those, and it comes up with a assumption, a pattern that you've never even thought about. So let's say I'm walking down a dark alley and someone comes out of that dark alley. I'm going to react really fast and really immediately based on that. Not because I'm thinking that this is a dangerous situation, but because my brain has seen tons and tons of films and movies where bad things happen in dark alleys. And so it's created a pattern. And so it's going to immediately kick in fear, flight responses, freeze responses um, based on the unconscious patterns. So walking and biking, we talked about those already. Good examples. Um, like in your favorite show. You know, so what's your favorite show? Is it uh, Stranger Things, Game of Thrones, This Is Us, you know, whatever. Stop liking that show right now. Stop. And it sounds silly, right? You, you can't just stop liking a show because it's not a conscious decision. It's an unconscious pattern that you've learned and you just like that show now, right? There's lots of different life experiences that came together that made that particular show attractive to you but you can't just stop liking something. So if you can't stop liking your favorite TV show, how do you sell, tell someone to just stop liking heroin, right? You're just not so simple. Um, stop believing in whatever political party you believe in. Stop believing in your religion, right? Like you can't just stop these things. These are very deeply ingrained belief systems and thought patterns, and it's largely become unconscious. So that when we think about it, if I think about my religion, I automatically have positive feelings towards it um, and positive associations with it that I'm not part of my conscious process, right? I'm not thinking, oh, I should like this. It's already built in unconsciously. So unconscious learning is a huge, huge part of how your brain works. Actually, most of your learning is unconscious. And this is really important when it comes to addiction and mental health because we have to realize that, again, we can't tell people things. It's not a, it's not a conscious process that can help us initiate that process. So it's not that it's completely um, not valuable. There is value to education. But as uh, our bright guy said, knowledge is not understanding and experience drives skill set building and learning. So I can't just learn about riding the bike. I have to do it. It's the only way to do it. This Example here, we have uh, two dolls, and if you're familiar with Brown versus um, the Board of Education, they did this study in the 50s where they gave children two dolls and they said, which one's prettier? And whether they were a white child or a black child, they always chose the white child as a prettier doll. Now you know that there's no Afri African-American families out there raising their children to tell them that white children are more beautiful than black children. That doesn't happen, right? But somehow the children had internalize this assumption that this is prettier. 
And again, that's all unconscious learning, right? It's getting all these data points from TV, from conversations people have, from the media, and then the brain comes up with a pattern and an answer and an unconscious belief system that you don't even realize you have. So what I'd encourage you to do is, for example, go to the Harvard Implicit Bias Test website. So Harvard Implicit Bias Test, just Google it. And what people find out is that they often have unconscious biases towards people of different skin colors, towards people of different religions, and people get upset about it. They're like, oh, well, I'm not racist, or you know, I'm not sexist, or I'm not against this religion. But they have these unconscious data points that the patterns the brain has built and you can't just constant, consciously change those. So it's really based on what films you watch and who you hang around and what conversations are happening. Your brain's constantly internalizing all of this and creating an unconscious belief system around it that then has an effect on you. Um, and your unconscious brain works much, much faster because it's all an automated process. The point is to reduce the energy expenditure and make things as fast as possible. And so the unconscious brain is always working kind of in the background and driving thoughts and behaviors and decisions uh, where the conscious brain is only a small part of that. So that is really where our addictions and our mental health issues come in is you have these unconscious highways that are built up and to change that unconscious highway is really, really difficult. Now it can be done, people do it all the time, um, but you have to go through the experience. Like even if I wanna change a bias that I might have towards someone of a different skin color, having that conscious decision is part of that process but it's really about exposure. I really just have to expose my unconscious brain again and again to alternative thoughts and to examples of alternative thoughts. And that will eventually build a new um, automated algorithm in the brain to have that new belief system. But that's the only way it has to be. It has to go from conscious to unconscious. Uh, the language is the same way, right? We learn the language, you start off consciously, you look at the grammar, you look at the vocabulary, but it's not until you're unconscious brain has created the automated algorithms that you suddenly become um, conversational or fluent in the language. So one of the last things that we're going to look at here is just culture and mental illness. I doubt you've probably ever heard of any of these syndromes. So DAT syndrome, um, you often find that in South Asia, like Pakistan, India, those areas. Uh, it's the belief that something's wrong with your semen, that you're ejaculating in a problematic manner and this is causing fatigue or weakness or loss of life. Um, Koro is another one, it's more um, East Asia, where they believe uh, men, this is only East Asian men. So these are culturally specific mental health issues that you don't find outside of specific cultures. So Koro uh, was East Asian, the idea that again, kind of similar to that syndrome, where they believe their penis is shrinking and it's shrinking into their body and then that they're going to die. Uh, Amok you'll find in Malaysia, it is a really uh, serious illness where people just go, on murderous rampages. Czar, you'll find in places like Iran or Africa, um, it's often associated with demon possession, and then anorexia nervosa. So most people here are probably familiar with that one. Who is most likely to struggle with anorexia? What demographic or, or group of people? And I'm sure you're saying, you know, middle class, to upper class, white women, or Western women, and you would be correct. Um, anorexia doesn't really exist in um, lower socioeconomic groups. It often doesn't exist in other ethnicities as much, and it doesn't exist globally as much. So on the right here, we have Dr. Sing Lee, and he did some really interesting studies with what became anorexia in uh, East Asia, in Hong Kong. So in China and Hong Kong, there was no anorexia um, before the 90s. There was no documented cases of it. No one had ever heard of it. But as a lot of people probably know, Hong Kong was owned by or ruled by the British and so what happened one day is this girl in the 90s, she, she fainted um, in the streets and the British newspapers picked it up and decided that she had anorexia. So now Dr. Sing Lee had been in Hong Kong, he was Western trained um, medically, and he had never seen a case of anorexia, though he was working with a bunch of women who had issues with eating, but there was no connection to the idea of being fat. For um, these Chinese women, these Hong Kongese women, they were just feeling bloated. They were feeling like they couldn't eat. So he was saying that, oh, okay, maybe this is anorexia or it's a culturally specific variant of anorexia. But then what happened is when the news stories came out um, in the British papers, which were then translated into Chinese, suddenly cases of Western anorexia started popping up all over the country um, because people had suddenly found a different cultural form of expression for a particular level of mental distress. 
And so sometimes you'll see people say, well, you know, maybe it was there the whole time and, you know, people just didn't know what it was. So it wasn't being diagnosed. Well, no, that's not the case. Um, it's never the case. And this is a really great example because we have Dr. Singh Lee here who was studying it for two decades before and was trying to find anorexia and couldn't find it anywhere in the country. And he was the only person that people would send people to for any kind of eating disorder. Um, but he found nothing like what we had in the West. And then suddenly once there was a cultural language around it and people were familiar with it, it became a mode of expression. And so we see this, this is really important to understand that mental distress or mental pain uh, is universal, right? Everyone can experience mental distress or mental pain, but the way that we express that pain, um, both consciously and unconsciously is related to what's called a cultural symptom pool. So we pull from what's around us and it's the same idea of a meme, right? We see memes, they get passed along throughout the culture. You know, luckily 20 years ago, we didn't have people walk into buildings and shoot people up in the US, right? That wasn't the thing that happened, but now it happens quite frequently, unfortunately. Behaviors are like memes, right? They get copied from person to person. And so if I am a person in a certain level of distress, I look to the culture to see what is a proper expression of that distress. And unfortunately in the US, going and shooting a bunch of people up has become um, one of those ways to express uh, a certain level of distress or pain. Uh, just like for a lot of women, anorexia is a certain expression of distress um, around control or power or body weight and image. Um, these things kind of come and go with different cultures. And we've seen it in the West as well, right? We used to have, a, what was it, shaking leg syndrome we've seen or used to see like women would faint all the time, right? You know, not even a hundred years ago, it was not uncommon for women to just get distressed and faint. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. You saw that homosexuality used to be a diagnosable disease, right? It was a mental disorder until about 1950. So a lot of disorders tend to be around deviant behavior and just changes with the culture and what becomes culturally appropriate and deviant or not deviant or normal. Uh, and so this is something else that I think is really important for people to understand is that uh, distress is normal. Uh, and then people have to find ways to express that distress and a lot of it's done unconsciously and they don't really understand why but if they can figure that out if they can rebuild different roads in their conscious and unconscious brains then they're going to be able to overcome a lot of these issues um, domestic violence I, I actually worked in domestic violence for uh, a while a long time ago and you would never ever go and hear that someone would say well you know, this abuser's anger issues are a disease, right? You know, so we shouldn't blame him. He, he's just got a genetic disease or she's got a genetic disease and that's why they're abusive. Like that doesn't happen, right? And I've actually been in treatment centers that treat both um, domestic abuse abusers as well as people struggling with addiction and they'll hold the two disparate beliefs. The addiction, people struggling with addiction are doing it because they're genetically predetermined and it's a disease. And then the people that have the domestic violence issues and the abuse issues and the anger issues are doing it because they're not responsible and they haven't been raised right and it's their choice, right? So um, just very cultural way about differentiating. It just becomes down to what the culture, how the culture wants to separate blame and how they want to assign responsibility. And the reality is that both of those situations are built up through unconscious processes, right? We can teach people not to be so angry. We can teach people to behave in different ways. You see it all the time in um, domestic violence support groups and domestic violence training. Um, we see it all the time in addiction, right? Recovery is possible. You know, another example I like to give is, you know, we had the, the trade centers, right? And uh, about one third, about 33% of Americans believe that the World Trade Centers are an inside job. There is a lot of a conspiracy around that. You probably know someone, you may be someone that believes that. Uh, a lot of people have beliefs around the JFK assassination, right? That there's some kind of conspiracy or cover up there. These are conspiratorial ideas, but no one would be determined to be crazy because of them. Yet, if I thought that the government was monitoring my thoughts from planes, I would be determined to be crazy, right? So I can believe in a conspiracy of the World Trade Centers because a lot of people do. And so it's not considered culturally deviant or abnormal. Whereas if I think it's people in planes flying overhead, then that's culturally deviant or abnormal and it becomes a diagnosable condition. So diagnoses, uh, especially for mental health, are really subjective. Um, and this is very positive 
for a lot of people because what it says is, hey, look, there's actually a way to recover from this and there's actually a way to change all of this. And it has a lot of the, has a lot to do with the way that we approach these things. It's not so much that I'm permanently broken. There's no such thing as me being permanently broken. I can always change. Um, I am normal, right? You know, just because other people say I'm not normal doesn't mean I'm not. I can define normal. I have to get other people to understand that, right? And we as a culture have to understand that people are dealing with normal things and they behave in certain ways or they think in certain ways and all that can be reworked. Um, maybe they need the help and support of a psychopharmaceutical to do that. Maybe they don't. Maybe they need the help of an MAT program with addiction. Maybe they don't, right? Everyone's different. A lot of factors are different. But what we do know is that we have to work on all of these factors together. Can't just look at small influence of genetics. We can't just look at personal life history and trauma. We can't just look at their friend groups, the culture, right? All these pieces have different factors that are coming together. So where does this leave us, right? What are the important things to take away from this? Number one, mental distress is the brain's version of physical pain. That's all that we're dealing with, with addiction and mental health issues, is there is mental distress, something is wrong, there is pain somewhere, right? And when we have pain, our brain sends us signals that get us to try and act, or get us to try and change things, or get us to frame things in such a way that we're able to deal with that stress, um, we're able to deal with that pain. And so if we understand that, then we understand that we have to help eliminate people's pain, we have to help eliminate their distress, and the addiction and mental health issues will often start to subside just by helping them with that distress. Uh, reactions to mental distress are influenced by your environment, your life history, your culture, and your biology. These factors are probabilistic, not causal, not deterministic. Super, super important, keep driving this point home. Everything's a probability, and it doesn't, no probability determines anything, right? It just increases your chances of something happening. Once something happens, it doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. You can go and wire the brain in different directions so that you can move on or not be in distress or not behave or think in the same ways. Um, people change all the time, right? We see it constantly. You've changed yourself a ton in your life. So just like you can change, they can change. Genetics account for less than 10% of the total influence are not deterministic, just driving that point home. Through normative developmental brain processes, automated and deeply encoded behaviors are formed through unconscious learning processes. These processes can be changed through sustained conscious effort. Really, really important. Recovery is possible from mental health issues, from addiction issues, but it's a very difficult and it's a very long road, right? It takes a long time for that to happen for most of us. Every once in a while, and I should bring this up, you'll see someone that just snaps their fingers and changes, right? There's a couple things that come into play. One, they probably weren't struggling with the behavior for as long, so the pathway or the highway was not as built up. Um, but more importantly, there weren't as many connections to that highway, so it was easier to build a new one or go in a different direction. But you'll also see people that have really strongly built up highways in other directions. So let's take a guy that smoked for 30 years. So he's smoking for 30 years, and then one day he just quits and walks away. Well, how the heck does that happen, right? How can people do that? It's because they have another highway that's more important to them. Maybe it's they had a health scare and they realize how important their family is. And they have a very, very strong highway for family. And so what they do is they take the brain connections that were going towards smoking and then connect them to family that's already there and just start using that neural network and that super highway instead. Um, let's say that you believe that uh, you're kind of anti-authoritarian, right? And you don't want anyone getting the best of you. And one day you kind of realize that, oh my God, you know what? These cigarette companies have me, you know, by the throat and they're controlling my life. And so you have this entire pathway you've built up for your entire life where you don't want anyone controlling what you do, right? You want to be able to make your own decisions. So suddenly that clicks in and your brain shifts and starts using that pathway that's already there. doesn't have to be built up, doesn't need new energy to do it but it realizes that this is more important, this is a more important pathway than that previous one. So that's how spontaneous change can happen, but oftentimes it's not that easy, right? The key to recovery is neurological change. Like physical health, mental health is improved through consistent workouts, motivation, and the right supports. So when we look at recovery programs, whether you're talking about mental health or addiction treatment, there are four things that people need. They need purpose, meaning, hope, and community. When people have those four things, they're very likely to be able to find recovery. Again, nothing's deterministic here, right? 
It just increases your probabilities of finding recovery. But these are the things that people need to be able to find that path and to find recovery for themselves most of the time. They also tend to be the biggest influences. Um, much more important than say telling someone that they have a genetic predisposition. That's not nearly as helpful as finding purpose, meaning, hope, and community. And we see that constantly, right? When we look at our examples of Native Americans versus Asian Americans, employed versus unemployed, um, different cultures, different levels of economic income, these things really drive addiction because they affect purpose, meaning, hope, and community most of the time. So that's it. I hope that this training was really useful for you. I hope that you understood what actually goes into creating addiction and mental health issues. And I hope it's really helped you kind of reframe your understanding so it makes more sense. I hope that you have a very systematic understanding now. So understand that there are a lot of different pieces that influence uh, addiction and mental health issues. And I want to really have you walk away with the knowledge that it is possible to change and everyone can do it. You're not broken, you're not permanently messed up. There's nothing wrong with your biology that you can't change, right? You have the ability to create change in your life. That can be scary for some people. That puts a lot of responsibility because suddenly they say, okay, well, I have the, I have the ability to change, now suddenly I'm responsible for that change, right? Um, that can be a scary thing for people, but it should be a hopeful thing. And that's what I hope is how you look at it. It gives you hope for yourself, for a loved one, for people you know, and knowing that's gonna be really, really hard. It's not a simple choice. It's not just a simple matter of, of changing this factor and just finding new friends or, or just finding a job or you know moving to a different country. Like you know, one little thing is not going to solve it for you most of the time. It's going to be a combination of things that you have to constantly work at and constantly focus on and be aware of until you create that unconscious learning process that's automated, a new behavior and a new thought pattern. Um, this is all my contact information. You are welcome to get a hold of me. Uh, why do we do these trainings? This is really important to me. One of our main goals is to reshape the field of addiction treatment behavioral health. And so there's no business value to this training per se, right? Talking about addiction and the neurobiology and neurochemicals and genetics, right? This is not something that we do from a business standpoint, but it's very, very connected to who we are and what our mission is to reshape the field for the better. And so I hope that this training is able to give you insights that allow us to reshape the way that we do addiction treatment in the US because it has to change. We're misunderstanding the causes, we're misunderstanding the factors, we're misunderstanding the weight of those factors, right? Most people still believe that genetics are a driving force in addiction and that's not the case. And that leads to a lot of um, ineffective treatment is uh, unfortunately the case. So if we can reshape the way that we approach this and understand this and look at the data and really have that kind of lead the way and then interpret that data correctly, that's gonna help us actually start solving um, some of these issues that we're seeing in our communities and within our families. As promised, here are all the sources. So if I did not quote the source on the page, this is where you will find all of the sources for all of the other um, studies that we mentioned throughout. So you can kind of go and use these. And if you would like me to send you these sources, just email me. I'm more than happy to email you back and send them to you. So thank you again for attending this training. I do hope you found it helpful and please get in touch with me and let me know what you thought because I'm very, very interested in connecting with others and moving this forward. So if you do want to collaborate or if you just have follow-up questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you.